So today we have Dr. Eileen Kodivko. She is with Purdue. And she is a professor there where she teaches and does research and extension work in soil conservation and management. So her research is focused on many different areas, including the impacts of drainage on crop yields, nitrate losses to surface waters, the interaction of earthworms. She has also been known as the earthworm lady. So it sounds like she, in her previous work, she won't be talking about it today, but she's done a lot of work on earthworms. So you can quiz her about that later. Uh, soil management and soil physical properties and cover crops and conservation tillage for soil health. So she has done a lot of work at Purdue um, during her career there working with soil health and management and specifically it sounds like earthworms were something fun she worked on as well. Um, she's actually a founding member of the Midwest Cover Crop Council as well. So Eileen has done a lot of great things and held quite a few leadership roles if you read her bio. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Eileen Kodivko. All right, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and happy to know that <clears throat> South Dakota right now is not getting snow and Indiana, I'm missing the big six to nine inches of snow that's falling in Indiana right now, which is very unusual for us. So, so uh, I'm even happier to be here. Uh, but we were here for the Midwest Cover Crops Council, uh, which was held uh, the, earlier this week. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today uh, is some of the, our work, our work as a group on cover crops and their impact on um, soil health. Many of you have used cover crops and are already very well aware of that. You've heard a couple of talks at this conference about regenerative ag, uh, sustainability. Um, some of you are maybe not doing cover crops, not using cover crops, but are thinking about it. So hopefully for all of you, whether you're very experienced or very new to it, there'll be a few things here that are either new for you or remind you of why you're doing um, working on cover crops. <clears throat> I always like to start out by reminding us about the, the rationale for using cover crops period, okay? And the rationale is really to have something living and growing at times of the year that we typically don't have any plants living and growing. Um, and, and Dr. Chris Nichols yesterday talked about 280 or 290 days, I don't remember the number, but basically her point was have something growing as much of the year as you can so that we can capture sunlight, um, sequester carbon, feed those organisms, trap and recycle nutrients, and basically make better use of the time and the resources that we have available to us. Another way of looking at that is a, is a nice picture here. This was at the Purdue Agronomy uh, Farm a, a number of years ago. It happened to be a year where we had an early harvest. So harvest uh, occurred in early September, um, and you can see here that our, our corn and our soybean plots were harvested, brown, brown all September, October, November, half of December, brown or white during the winter, brown in March, brown in April. The grass strip between the plots, this wasn't a cover crop, it's just the, the grass that we have as uh, kind of borders, green and growing all fall, maybe stopped about mid-December, greened up again in early March, April, so we're basically extending the green period of the year and shrinking that brown gap. And so that's really part of our objective uh, when we are using uh, cover crops. You've already heard this as well, that cover crops are part of a system. Um, as somebody who tries to educate about cover crops, uh, one of the worst things that I can hear is when somebody says, you know, I woke up this morning and I decided I'm going to plant cover crops on 4,000 acres of my farm and I don't know anything about them, but I'm just going to do them. Well, for some people, that's a great idea, but for a lot of people, that's not such a great idea, right? There are different potential benefits and different um, challenges for any kind of cover crop that we might grow. Um, and as you've also heard from a couple of the speakers, you need to adapt your cropping system when you integrate cover crops into it. You can't just do everything else the same uh, because it's going to affect nutrient management. It might affect tillage or no tillage management. It might affect manure or pest management. And so you have to actually adapt the system in order to successfully integrate cover crops into them. Um, and there is a learning curve and, and you need to do your homework. 
And I tell this to my fellow researchers, extension folks, conservation agency staff, as well as farmers, that you know there is a learning curve. Um, you have to do some homework. That can be by going to meetings like this, by talking to farmers in your area who have successfully adopted it, by going to the various field days and training sessions, as well as reading things online. Um, but, but there is homework to be done in order to be uh, successful. Many of you have seen this uh, definition that NRCS uses for soil health, which actually came from some scientific work that started back in the, in the 90s, but it's that continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants and animals and us. Uh, so a couple of points to, to uh, emphasize here. It's that continued capacity, right? So not just the capacity to do that for one year, but the capacity to do that over the long term. Uh, for the soil to function, I don't know how many of you have thought about the fact that we ask the soil to do a lot of things for us, right? So we ask it to function in certain ways. Um, and then sustaining us, okay? So soil health is, is trying to do all of that together. Uh, I work more in the soil physical properties than in the chemical or biological, although I, I do, do some work with uh, biology as well. What are some of the characteristics of a healthy soil? Uh, this list happens to be a little bit more oriented towards the physical conditions of the soil. So let's just take a quick look at that. We want to have good water infiltration, um, especially out here where you need a lot more of the rainfall than maybe we do in Indiana where we want to get rid of some of the excess. Uh, you need to have that water infiltrating into the soil, and you need some of that to be retained by the soil for plant water use, um, so storage of that water. Uh, we need a resistance to, to crusting and erosion. We do ask the soil to filter things for us. If any of you have a septic tank uh, behind your home uh, in rural areas, you're asking the soil to do some of that filtering. Of course, we need good rooting depth. We want trafficability. We need to be able to drive over the soil if we're going to plant large acres as opposed to a little garden. Um, we need adequate aeration and nutrient availability. So those are just some of the characteristics that we would talk about with a healthy soil. This doesn't really go into any detail on the biological characteristics that, that we would want. Many of you have seen the principles, the soil health principles that NRCS talks about, and at least a couple speakers at this conference have talked about these principles as well. Uh, so I won't spend a whole lot of time, but just to remind you that these are principles, as pointed out by several speakers. How you apply them to your farm or your ranch is going to vary. Uh, what you do here in South Dakota, what we do in Indiana, and even on any individual farm or ranch is going to vary. But think about those principles. Uh, we want to minimize disturbance, and a lot of times we think about no-till as, as the way to minimize physical disturbance. We want to maximize soil cover, and again, no-till is one way to keep cover on the soil. We want to maximize biodiversity, have more than just one crop one plant all the time, we'd like more than that, um, and then providing continuous living roots. So that again is having something living and growing for as much of the 365 days of the year as your climate will allow. And that is going to help stimulate soil biological activity <clears throat> and build soil health. So looking at a couple of the practices that we commonly use, and my experience is pretty much exclusively in the eastern Corn Belt, so how these uh, uh, fit exactly in the middle or western parts of South Dakota, I can't tell you, right, because you're a lot drier. Um, but these are some of the practices that, that certainly can be adapted. So cover crops, this is a cereal rye cover crop growing in um, one of my plot areas in, in southeastern Indiana um, after corn. Um, No-till. In this case, we were at, at this stage in this experiment, we were doing continuous corn no-till on a, on a drainage project that I had. Um, extended crop rotations, which I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that in Indiana, corn, soybean, wheat is already an extended crop rotation, okay? Because we grow corn, soybean, corn, soybean, and even having a third crop for us is really um, extending the length of the rotation and the diversity of the rotation. I know that a lot of you have a much more diverse rotation than that, 
Um, but anytime we do that, we're going to be helping build soil health and, and uh, improving the, the diversity. And then perennials of various sorts, whether it's uh, grazing uh, in Kansas or whether it's uh, dairy grazing in, in central Indiana um, or whether it's making hay. Anytime we can have a perennial growing, uh, one of the keys for those is that they've got roots that stay in the soil for longer than in a typical annual crop. And usually there's more root mass because they have longer to grow and they, they may grow deeper. So let's focus in a little bit more on the cover crop part. I always suggest to people uh, that they really think hard about why they want to grow a cover crop. We know that cover crops are good, okay, but what's the next level of that answer? In particular, why do you want to plant the cover crop? So what is your main purpose for a cover crop on that field? Um, in NRCS uh, jargon, it would be what are the resource concerns? What are you trying to, what kinds of problems are you trying to solve? Uh, because that main purpose is going to affect, first of all, which cover crop or crops you select and then how you manage those, okay? So, but you need to understand what your goals are before you start that process. So there's a long list of potential benefits of cover crops, and I'm not going to go through all of those. I just uh, wanted to kind of remind you that growing a cover crop, there are different reasons you might do that, which you know, just reminding you, okay, what are those reasons? <clears throat> Are you looking uh, for, for it primarily as a nitrogen scavenger? Those of us who have tile drains with nitrate getting into the tile drains and going down the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico, that's one of our main goals that we have in the more humid parts of the Corn Belt, for example. Maybe you're more interested in producing nitrogen, in which case, of course, you're going to need to use a legume. Maybe your primary purpose is controlling soil erosion, whether that's water erosion or wind erosion. Um, or improving soil quality and soil health, aggregate stability, which we'll talk a little bit about, uh, biological activity, <clears throat> increasing soil organic matter or sequestering carbon um, to improve your soil by improving that organic matter. Maybe that's your main goal. Um, conserving soil moisture, having a good mulch to conserve that moisture. Recycling nutrients so that you don't lose them, that you recycle them for pre, uh, addition, later crops. Maybe weed control or pest suppression, or maybe you have use for extra forage and a cover crop could be useful for that. Regardless of which one or two of those are your main purpose, the last one I think is a goal for everybody, right? And that's to increase crop yields over the long term um, and minimize, decrease those year to year variability in yields. So I am gonna talk just a little bit more about the soil physical properties. That happens to be the area that I, that I emphasize in, in my uh, research and, and that I uh, teach on, uh, but that's really related to that aggregate stability, which we heard several folks talk about this morning, Rick Clark among others. So soil physical properties can be improved and this would be, include aggregate stability or aggregation. Um, they're especially improved where you have fibrous rooted cover crops, right, because those roots and mesh the particles, they kind of draw them together and, and hold them together. You know, if you've ever dug, tried to dig up a, a good sod, you know how difficult it is to kind of pull it apart, right? Well, that's really good for improving aggregation and improving stability. Um, and basically also the root exudates, those carbon compounds that get leaked out of the roots are food for the microorganisms. And so then those microorganisms eat that, those um, exudates and form polysaccharides, which are basically gluey, glue uh, substances that glue those particles together. Soil physical properties are improved also uh, by improving porosity and uh, channels in the soil. And this is especially true, of course, for the deep, uh, the tap-rooted crops. So those deep roots form macropores, which then allow water to flow into the soil when you have heavy rainstorm um, activity. It also helps with aeration and also helps with rooting of your next uh, cash crop. Certainly by protecting that uh, soil surface and by having better aggregation, you also have less crusting and, and less erosion. And then the roots themselves, just the presence of the roots from this living cover crop are going to improve the trafficability of the soil. So you're able to actually get on the field a bit earlier where you have that stability from, um, from the cover crops. 
This is some of the work from one of my uh, uh, master students, Joe Rorick, uh, who, who looked at cover crops and aggregate stability. Um, and just to uh, take a look at some, some data, on the vertical axis we have our measure of uh, mean weight diameter or, or aggregate size stability. And we had four different depths here that we sampled. This had been after five years of cover crops in, in uh, southeastern Indiana. Um, and then the gold bars here are the cereal rye, the gray, the no cover. And you can see at these top two depths, 0 to 10 and 10 to 20 centimeters, which is 0 to 4 and 4 to 8 inches, there was a, a significantly higher aggregate stability for the rye compared to the no cover. Okay, at both of those top two depths after... It was actually after four years of, of cereal rye cover crop. The, the deeper depths going down to uh, 40 and 60 centimeters or down to two feet had not yet shown any improvement in um, aggregate stability, but where we really want that improvement in aggregate stability is near the surface where we have erosion and where we have roots starting to grow from our cash crops. So we had a significant increase in that aggregate stability. And that's one of the things that usually changes fairly quickly. There was uh, at least one question this morning to Rick about uh, how do you know you're making improvements and, and what kinds of things improve. Um, aggregate stability is one of those that usually increases pretty rapidly, not the first year, but within two to three years, you typically are able to see this improvement. And by having that increased stability, you're going to improve your water infiltration, you're going to reduce your erosion and crusting, so you already see some benefits from that improvement in a fairly short period of time. Cover crops and no-till uh, go together. Uh, you can use either one of them separately, but they really uh, have synergistic effects on soil structure when, when you uh, are using both of those together. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a slide from my, my um, colleague Tom Casper in Iowa, where he actually made some simulated rainfall measurements uh, with cover crops to put some numbers to, to that. And so on the left, uh, so th this was a cover crop grown in the, in the fall, and these, these measurements were made in the spring. So the no cover crop um, plot had uh, quite a bit of erosion. You can see that it kind of eroded down to the compacted part of the wheel track in that case. Where he had oats cover, so spring oats planted in the fall, which is a common cover crop for us, so that it does winter kill by design. Um, so it, was, it still had good amount of residue, and it cut the erosion in half compared to the no cover crop. Where we had the cereal rye cover crop, so these measurements were made in, in uh, early April. Um, so the cereal rye had, had uh, come out of dormancy and was starting to grow again, and it cut the erosion um, even further. So this is illustrating that classic purpose for cover crops, right? To cover the soil to reduce erosion. They're very effective in reducing erosion, whether they're dead or alive, but they're even more effective when they're still alive than, than dead. <clears throat> Another picture from uh, Tom is, is illustrating, um, again, one of those places where we really want cover crops, and that would be anybody who has corn silage ground. Um, on the, on these, this picture was taken in, in early May. Um, so on the right here, we have the corn silage ground. Of course, everything's been taken off except about eight inches of the, the corn stalk. Um, and over the course of the winter and early spring, that soil has crusted and eroded. The microbes are starving in there, waiting for some new food. The nutrients that might have been in there, particularly the nitrate, has been lost, been leached out from the soil profile. Um, on the left, where we have a cereal rye cover crop, green and growing, protecting the soil against erosion, trapping those nutrients so that they don't get lost pumping carbon into the soil to feed those organisms. So again, if you're thinking about your soil, that's expensive soil that you're letting just uh, get degraded and, and washed away. And so part of the uh, deal with a cover crop is to keep that expensive soil right where you want it on your farm. Sometimes I have some uh, cooperators or some other farmers that I'm talking with in Indiana that get a little discouraged when they don't see a whole lot of top growth on their cover crop, especially um, in the fall, right? They maybe only see a couple of inches and they go, man, was this worth it? <clears throat> well, 
a lot of times there's a lot more for a cover crop there's a lot more root growth than there is top growth and really for a lot of our purposes the root growth may be more significant for what we want than than the top growth so if your primary purpose is to build soil aggregation and soil health the root mass is usually much more important than the than the tops Certainly you need reasonable shoot growth for some purposes, right? Like erosion control, you would need to have pretty good uh, top growth as well. If you're trying to use it as forage or you're trying to use it for suppressing weeds, you're going to need the top growth. But, but if you don't have very much top growth in the fall, it doesn't necessarily mean that your cover crop was not worth it, right? Because there's a lot more going on below the ground um, that, that is very important. This was... One of my graduate students, the, the day after Thanksgiving a few years ago, where we went out to one of our farmer cooperator fields where he had some, uh, some of the daikon radishes. Um, and you can see here, we were just kind of sampling some of the radishes and, and you can see there's the, the radish and there's the long taproot, right? So from the standpoint of improving the soil, the, the, tub the tuber is what everybody brags about, right? You go to a farm show and everybody shows these giant radishes. That's fine, but really what's more important is that taproot that's underneath that, that radish because that's going to allow for water flow and aeration and for root growth from your subsequent uh, corn crop. So many of you may have seen this uh, demonstration uh, from NRCS. It's a very good demonstration to show that aggregate stability uh, that we hope to build with no-till and, and cover crops. Um, so in this case, um, th this was the same soil type, but on the left we had a, a soil that had been in long-term no-till and cover crops, and so those microorganisms had made those glues to, to glue those aggregates together and keep them stable. Um, and on the right here was one that had been intensively tilled uh, and no cover crop for many years. When you carefully drop those uh, soil clods into, onto a screen um, in the cylinders here, you can see this one just falls apart. It has no glue to keep the particles together. Um, and so if you're out in a field, that would all be eroded away. Um, and if you're on flat ground, it might not go off your field, but it's gonna go into your soil and plug up your soil, right? So that's erosion. Whereas on the left here, the water got into that clod, air exited, and is very stable. So that's what we want to have, right? So maybe you want that on your farm, but what about maybe your county commissioners or your county drainage board or the equivalent, right? Are they, do they care about that? Well, yeah, they do. Um, and and uh, one of the things that we look at is by making our soil closer to what it was before we started tilling and intensively managing it, um, we can make those soils go back to being more like a, a sponge, okay? And you've heard that already at this conference as well. Um, this is a very readable report. Uh, Andrea Bache, who was here, I'm not sure if she's still here or not, actually uh, wrote that before she went to a University of, of Nebraska um, in the agronomy department there. But it's basically turning soils into sponges, and it's how farmers can help rebuild soils so that we have more water infiltration, less runoff, less flooding. They looked at um, field experiments from all over the world uh, where they included things like perennials and cover crops and no-till. Um, and what they were looking for was what impact did it have on water infiltration and runoff and flooding. So they found that continuous living cover was the best strategy where you could do that. So in other words, perennials. Um, but cover crops were the next best thing. Um, and the, they increased water infiltration, decreased runoff, increased soil water holding capacity. So the bottom line is that it made more water available for crop use, especially in drought years. Um, and there was less runoff and flooding in both wet and dry years. So it's a benefit not only to the individual farmer or rancher, but it's also a benefit to society um, for not having uh, as much flooding if those soils could actually hold more of that water right there in the field. Of course, there is a limit, right? 
putting cover crops or perennials, it's not going to prevent flooding, uh, but it is going to reduce the occurrence of it, right? So once the soil is saturated um, the, and the water table is at the soil surface, um, then whether you have healthy soil or not is not going to make a whole lot of difference in, in the amount of surface runoff at that moment. Uh, but the healthy soils will remain more stable even under those exceptionally wet conditions and they'll recover faster. So in, in Indiana and, and Ohio, and I understand out here also in South Dakota, spring of 2019 was extremely challenging, very, very wet, a lot of prevented planting acres. Um, and so we need healthy soils along with other um, practices to reduce the damage from that exceptionally wet condition and to reduce the flooding that might occur. This was actually 2017, not 2019, but um, in southwestern Indiana. To just show some examples here, this was um, the end of June in southwestern Indiana. Big snow, uh, big snowstorm, right? Got snow on the brain. Big rainstorm um, that occurred. Uh, and so huge amounts of runoff coming off the fields. This was a conventionally tilled cornfield, right? So no cover, no, uh, not no-till, conventionally tilled. Huge amount of water running off, very, very muddy. Lots of erosion, lots of nutrients being lost um, at that same time. Just down the way was a cover cropped, no-till soybean field. Now, you know, soybeans we usually think of as being more erodible than corn, but this was no-till, it was cover cropped, also a lot of water coming off of that storm because it was such a huge uh, storm event, but pretty clear. And if we compare the two, right, this is the drainage ditch that was draining most of the fields in the area. And here was the water coming off of that soybean field. And you could see that clear water that then is going into the muddy water that was originating from all those other plots. So, so again, if you're somebody who has to uh, think about your county drainage, if you have drainage where you are in South Dakota, um, then you've got, got other incentives besides building soil health for the individual farmer. I want to talk just briefly about the nitrogen scavenging benefits of, of cover crops. Um, even our best managed, that best managed as we know how, uh, corn and um, uh, soybean fields have nitrate losses that are greater than what we would want, both for water quality downstream as well as economics of the farmer. You don't want to put nitrogen on that you then lose. Um, <clears throat> so we want to deal with that. And I have a, uh, a study that went on for about 35 years uh, in southeastern Indiana, so down in this part of the, of the state. Um, and obviously the, the specific results do not apply directly to uh, your conditions here, but the general results have been pretty common across Midwestern tile-drained um, sites. So I'm going to spend just a little time on this graph. On the vertical axis, we have uh, the annual nitrate nitrogen concentration in parts per million or milligrams per liter um, over the course of about 30 years of this study. The, the drinking water standard is 10 parts per million, so that's, we want to at least be below that. We'd, for water quality benefits, we'd like to actually be below about five, but we at least want to be below 10. In the early part of our study, we were growing continuous corn. We had high fertilizer nitrogen rates, the extension recommendations at the time. We had no cover crop, and we were doing uh, tillage. Uh, spring chisel till, actually, and we had concentrations that were between 20 and 35 parts per million in that early part of the study, which is high, but which was very typical uh, for the eastern corn belt at that, at that time. Uh, extension recommendations changed, and we reduced the nitri nitrate, uh, nitrogen fertilizer a little bit, and our concentrations dropped, so now we were more in the 15 to 30 part per million range, uh, we still have annual variations because corn yield uh, varies based on water availability, okay? Um, and then after 10 years of this continuous corn treatment, we changed to a corn-soybean rotation, which means we put nitrogen fertilizer on every other year. Because it was a corn-soybean rotation, we could decrease our nitrogen application rate. We started using a, a cover crop 
and we did no-till. So you can already see that as a researcher, that's one that's, that I'm going to pull my hair out, right? Because I got four different things that we changed kind of at the same time, but we were looking at it as a system. And over the, the course of that time, we are now at or below, consistently at or below 10 part per million, more like in the five to eight part per million consistently. So our concentrations dropped due to the fact that we added cover crops into the system and we reduced our fertilizer nitrogen rate over time. Um, and the, the, the weakness or the, the uh, yeah, the weakness of this study or the limitation of this study, I should say, is that we changed fertilizer rate and cover crop kind of at the same time. We can't separate them out, but I have, there are many studies in the Midwest, a lot of them in Iowa, that have consistently shown that reduction in nitrate leaching even when all they did was change and started implementing a cover crop. So it's a very common finding uh, that we have. So that's what I just said. Tile drain studies in the Midwest have consistently shown a reduction in nitrate leaching. Why? You got something green and growing. And when do we lose our nitrate? when our cash crop is brown, okay? We've already harvested. We lose most of our nitrate in late fall, winter, and early spring. We don't have anything growing. A cover crop would be growing and taking up that nitrogen. And that nitrogen is nitrogen that gets put back into your nitrogen bank account. I do caution people that it's not nitrogen that you can take out this year. So it's not a, not a checking account. You can't put it in in the winter and get it back this spring. In most cases, you're going to be building soil organic matter. So it's more like a certificate of deposit, right? A CD. You got to leave it in there a few years, build up that soil organic matter, and then you'll be able to uh, reap some of those benefits a little later. All right, I'm going to kind of shift a little bit and talk about um, how do you go about selecting cover crops for your situation, okay? Again, I emphasize to people that I really say, think hard about what your main purpose is or your main one or two purposes. Uh, what is your cropping and tillage system? Uh, your current cash crop, your tillage or no tillage system? Um, what time windows do you have available in order to plant a cover crop? Uh, do you want a winter hardy cover crop or do you want one that's going to winter kill, right? There's pluses and minuses to both of those. How are you going to seed it? How are you going to terminate it? Um, and then there's a whole host of, of very specific uh, points to make about uh, your soil type, your climate, uh, drought, manure, herbicide, and so on. So there's a lot of specifics that, that you need to get into as well. Some of these are written in green. If you can tell the difference between the green type and the black type here, those green ones, the Midwest Cover Crops Council or MCCC selector tool can help you with some of those. And I'm going to show just a couple of screenshots of that uh, to give you uh, a little bit of a taste of that. Another point I want to make is that the details are very important. <clears throat> Not all cover crops are going to work equally well for every purpose. And there's no one cover crop that's going to meet all the purposes that you might have. Of course, we would all love that, but that's not, not probably going to happen. So you want to think about your purpose and then select the cover crop that would be best um, and then manage those for the intended purpose. The same cover crop can be managed differently depending on what your purpose is, right? If you want to graze it, well, you have to have enough top growth to graze. If you want to plant corn, maybe you don't want so much top growth if it's cereal rye because then you have potentially a little more challenging uh, situation to manage for, for nitrogen. So um, that's all, all very important. Some of the considerations are, do you want cover crops that winter kill or do you want those that will uh, come back again in, in the spring? Many of our farmers who are just starting with cover crops in the Eastern Corn Belt want something that will winter kill because it makes the management simpler. And that's a great way to start, right? So if they plant a cover crop in the fall, they get some fall growth, they have some cover in the winter, but they don't have to worry in the spring about can they get out there to terminate it or is it too wet, right? That's taken off the table. So maybe you want something that will winter kill, especially when you're just starting out. <clears throat> if, you, if you plant something that will survive the winter and grow again in the spring, when and how are you going to terminate it? You know, how tall is it or what growth stage or how much biomass, 
um, and that's all going to depend on what you're planting next and, and what the weather is and so on. So there are some additional management considerations if you have something that's growing in the spring. And again, it's neither good nor bad, but you need to be prepared for it, right? You need to know, oh yeah, there's a cover crop. Oh yeah, maybe it's going to grow more than I thought. What is my plan A and my plan B to deal with that? Uh, do you want a single species or do you want mixtures? Again, there's pluses and minuses. A single species is probably easier to manage um, because you only have one thing that might be going from vegetative to reproductive or one thing that might want a flower or so on uh, as opposed to a mix. Um, and if you're in a watershed with uh, phosphorus concerns like we have in the Western Lake Erie Basin and the Eastern Corn Belt, uh, then you want to have at least one thing that doesn't winter kill, right? So that you have an opportunity uh, for that phosphorus that might get released from the winter killed cover crop to be taken up again by, by another cover crop. So there's three main categories of cover crops that we tend to use. And uh, the grasses, which are probably the most common, um, and they, they're really uh, good for fibrous roots, so building soil aggregation, and they're excellent nitrogen scavengers. The, the brassicas, the, the daikon radish is the kind of popular one right now, at least in the eastern Corn Belt. It's a great nitrogen scavenger. It doesn't do a whole lot to improve soil aggregation or to improve soil tilth. Um, and then uh, the legumes, uh, crimson clover, hairy vetch, red clover, uh, Austrian winter pea, many different ones there. And those are obviously what you want if you're trying to build soil nitrogen, right? If you're trying to fix soil nitrogen, then you're going to need a legume. The Midwest Cover Crops Council, which our, our table is right up here, just on the other side of the screen, um, has a, a, a number of great resources. I, I am biased. I was one of the founding members of that organization. So I think we have some really good resources and, and would encourage you to check us out if you're not already familiar with us. There's our website. Uh, but one of the things that we have is a selector tool. So right up here, the, the tab for selector tools. Uh, we also have recipes, and I'm going to talk about those both very briefly. So this is a page from the South Dakota portion of the selector tool, um, and it's the all-county average. Um, you can put in your county, and it will bring up the 30-year frost date information from your county and give you seeding dates for your county. So the way this, this works is all the cover crops are, are listed, um, and then we have dates across the top, and where you see these green bars, that's basically saying for your county, what are the reliable establishment dates for that cover crop on average from a 30-year average, right? So where it, whatever county you're in in South Dakota or any neighboring states, any state in, the, in our region, you can find out the, the reliable planting dates uh, from this based on 30-year weather averages. So that tells you the planting dates, and maybe that's all you need. You know, you're going, oh, I forgot. What's the planting date that I need to get my cereal rye planted by or my hairy vetch planted by in order to be reasonably assured that I'm going to be successful in getting it established? But our tool has a lot more than that, which we would like to offer to you. One of those features is maybe you don't know which cover crops can fit which goals. So you, um, in this case, we put in... Um, the goal erosion fighter and you can put in up to three goals and then it ranks those basically according to uh, how good or not it is for um, erosion control. <clears throat> All right, how to get started. We've heard over and over again uh, that, you know, many, many folks decide, okay, cover crops sound like a good thing. I want to do it, um, but I don't know how to do it. Um, because it's overwhelming, right? So much information, it's overwhelming. Tell me how to get started. Um, and so what we did then was developed the Midwest Cover Crops Council in concert with the local land grant, so South Dakota State in this case, um, recipes that are aimed at new cover crop users to basically say, here's a low risk entry point for using cover crops um, in, your, in your region. So the South Dakota, at, at the Midwest Cover Crops table over here, the South Dakota recipes are available. You can also get them uh, online, uh, but we've got two recipes available. And again, these are 
If you want to start and you haven't started and you don't know where to start, here's a low risk introduction point to using cover crops in, in uh, South Dakota. So you can go to our website and you can uh, pick, those, pick those up off of our website. Cereal rye often ends up being the cover crop of choice because it can be planted later than just about anything else. Um, and so often that ends up being one of them and that is one of them for, for you folks as well. There are other tools available as well. This is, this is from the uh, ARS group in North Dakota that shows you different cover crops and what some of their features are. If you, if you hover over any of those cover crops, it will bring you to an information page for that cover crop. There's lots of variations on the theme. So if some of you look at the recipes and you go, oh man, I've already done that years ago. I want something else. Great. Okay, lots of variations on the theme. Um, but what we tried to do was provide people with an easy starting point for those who maybe have not yet used covers. So I'm going to, I have a few minutes. Yes. That was a no. Yeah, you okay. <laughs> um, I, two slides left here. So if, ever, if cover crops and no-till are so good, uh, why isn't everybody using them? And you can give me all kinds of reasons, I'm sure. Um, but, but one of them is that there are short-term costs and often there's no short-term economic gain. Um, and it is site-specific. The details are really important. There is a steep learning curve. Technical assistance is often very important for uh, people to feel like they can do it successfully. Um, and we do, do still need some, some R&D uh, in each of our regions in order to fine tune these systems. But of course, we know a lot already, and many of you, many of you are successfully using them, others of you not, but uh, haven't tried. Um, we do know an awful lot and can help avoid a lot of the common mistakes that people make because we, so many other people have made them. I tell people, you don't have to make every mistake that everybody else has made, right? Just make a few. Um, I, when we talk about measuring soil health, uh, there's a lot of the new tests. I've heard Haney test mentioned. I've heard PLFA mentioned, biological tests. There's also the old fo soil physical property tests, right, where we take a look at aggregate stability uh, in, a, in a lab situation, water infiltration, penetrometer. And as was mentioned, I, I uh, have done a fair amount with earthworms during my career. Uh, so we often count earthworms as well. Um, so a couple of resources. If you have never Googled the NRCS soil health site, I, I would encourage you to do that. There's a lot of good soil health information there. And of course, I'm gonna end with our Midwest Cover Crops Council. Uh, we have the website. We have recipes, including South Dakota now. We have pocket guides, and we have pocket guides available at our table right over here for free, um, which are, are new uh, just a year ago. And with that, I think I will end. Thank you very much. Sorry, I misunderstood you. Okay. <laughs> so we have time for a couple questions. I see one in the front here. Thank you for coming and speaking today. In your slide, one of your slides, and in Rick's presentation earlier, the, the background in your slide was pretty much solid turnips, where the guy was holding the turnip with the deep rut. Yeah, the radish in this the radish, case. Radish, I'm yeah. sorry, mm -hmm. radish, okay. Is that common? No, uh, we don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the, the question is, uh, are solid radishes or, or turnips, uh, is that common? No, when we were first starting to do the cover crop work, the radishes were the cool thing. People were really excited about them. Uh, but the slide that didn't make it into this limited talk was that it also makes the soil very erodible. So uh, it, it makes the soil so <laughs> friable uh, and they decompose so quickly in the spring that by themselves, um, although it's a great seed bed, it's not a great seed bed because it's not there by the time you, you get there. It's too erodible. So we always recommend that that a radish or turnip be mixed with at least one other thing like either a grass or a legume. We usually say a grass. And oats for us, an oats radish mix is a very common mix as a winter kill mix uh, for, for people who want winter kill. If they don't want winter kill, then they could put it with cereal rye. But yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I live in an area that we have good potash soil tests, but we have a lot of tie-up of the potash and have potash deficiencies. In uh, one of Rick's slides, and, and you use a lot of cereal rye too, if you let the cereal rye get fairly mm. tall, it looks like there's a lot of potash in the biomass. Would that help make potash available in our soils? That's a great question. Um, while it's in the biomass, it's certainly not available, right? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, a fair amount of it would get washed out. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that one a little bit more. Um, yes, but potash, some of that would be leached out, whereas the, the nitrogen actually has to decompose before it's going to be available. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting question, if that would make it more available. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. David, that means it's a good question. <laughs> you can stump the speaker. <laughs> Well, um, for the sake of time, I think we'll wrap up questions at the moment, but Dr. Kodivka, will you be around for I'm a around bit? all day, not leaving until okay. tomorrow morning. Oh, don't tell them that. Yeah. <laughs> they were here late last night. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we really appreciate you coming. You know, uh, cover crops are, of course, a hot topic when we talk about soil health, and it's interesting to see research coming from someone in another state and from a university like Purdue that's known for doing a lot of ag research. So we really appreciate you coming in with that perspective and that corn bean uh, rotation, <laughs> this area, that's kind of what we have here. I'm from this general area, okay. so I feel like I can intelligently speak about it. And that's what we see here. We have uh, people adding to their rotation, but there's definitely some relatable people here in the audience, I'm sure. Yeah. So we appreciate your time, and I encourage you all to check out that Midwest cover crop tool. Um, South Dakota NRCS has a great tool as well that I often help people with, but we also use this one. It was built by uh, several NRCS and Extension folk, including myself, Anthony Bly, David Karkey, and it's, it's pretty localized and very well done. So check out their guides at their table and their tool. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kludivko, for coming today. Uh, a gift for you. Oh, oh, thank you. And we appreciate you traveling out and speaking with us. Thank okay. you. Thank you.